we always say good morning and like on Zoom and in person, I hear y'all. Good afternoon, it's 12. I just want to know, I hope you're right because it's a fruit of the spirit, right? I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm glad, I'm glad. Um, for those of you on Zoom, what I'm really excited about when I get to use my laptop to read my sermons off of it is I can see you. Uh, so I see you, David, I see you, Nicole, I see you, Evelyn, Clarissa, and the rest of y'all. I see all of y'all there joining us with Joyway Online. Y'all are the best. Um, I just want you to know if you got something to say, I can see it. So I, you, you, could, you could preach me down through the app, and I'm going to see a little red button. And be like, oh, they lit in here, and I'm going to tell them out here that they're not lit. <laughs> it's a little competition, a little friendly competition. Um, but I'm, I'm privileged today to bring you the word as we continue our study in Exodus. And while I know that we, at least our leadership team, just like kind of run our preaching uh, schedule in a pattern that's pretty much just really simple, somehow, somehow, I keep getting the really ridiculously like hard things to preach to y'all. Um, and I just want you to know David is over this, so maybe he's mad at me. Um, but today, I get the privilege of speaking to you about God's character of sovereignty. I get to teach you and tell you that God is sovereign. It's gonna be so much fun. So right now, we're gonna be looking at Exodus chapter five, verses one through 11. But real quick, this recap is for me, cause I know I've been doing, I have not been doing the reading, so I need to, I need to, I need to recap myself. You know what I'm saying? So for chapters one to four, I want to recap for me what's been going on. So just walk with me real quick, because I know the rest of y'all been reading. I know y'all been reading. I'm not even going to question you, okay? But up until this moment, we have seen that this ruler, this king, the pharaoh, he decided to do something rather unique, and he decided to oppress the people of Egypt. That was a joke if you didn't catch it. It's not really unique to go and hurt people. Uh, but he decided, this is what I'm going to do. He decided he was super smart in chapter one and started to say, look, their people are getting so great in number. They're going to harm us. Uh, and he's like, look, because they're afraid they become so great, that he was afraid that they would become so great and overthrow the powers in Egypt. He's like, we're just going to like subjugate them. We're going to take control of the, over these people. He demands then in this story that every Hebrew son, the firstborn son of these people, be thrown into the Nile. I don't know a lot about the Nile because I'm from Bushwick, but I looked it up and there's mad animals in it. It's not safe. And I just, overall, it's not a good thing to be throwing babies in water unattended. It just doesn't seem like a good idea. And so he does this for one thing and one thing in mind, not to be one of those lifeguards on TikTok that shows the baby float real quick, but to kill them, quite frankly. It's not a cute thing that's happening in this story. And when we started reading Exodus, I was like, whoa, out the gate, this book is spicy. Because then a Levite woman from one of the tribes of Israel, she has a baby. And she's having a baby during all of this craziness, and it just so happens to be a boy. And so she does everything she can to save her baby. She hides him for three months, but he starts to get too big to hide. And I don't know about y'all, but I know the parents sitting in the back know, try to hide a baby that don't stop making noise when there's someone trying to like kill them. I don't know, man. We be having a hard time with the crying and the whining and, and, and the screaming and the unnecessary noise making. And she's trying to hide this baby. He's getting too big, most likely too loud. And so she decides, you know, I'm going to have to put him in a basket and I'll have to try to hide him here in the reeds and hopefully something, you know, God does something or somebody comes by, something good happens. And in a miraculous series of events, baby Moses ends up finding his way under the safety of a very important person, under the safety of the Pharaoh's daughter, the same exact person trying to get all these young men killed. His daughter looks at this baby and takes pity on him, is, that, is what my translation says, word for word, took pity on him. He then gets older, living alongside the Egyptians, and one day, he sees this Egyptian beating a Hebrew man that was enslaved and working for them. And when Moses sees this, Moses kills that man. 
And that might sound like a really awesome man. I'm so glad he took care of this bad guy. But when you read the text, it's really like it says Moses looked like to the left and to the right. He 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 planned a little. He made sure no one could see. And then he hit the guy's body. So this is not like a good situation. He murders a guy and then tries to hide it. This is the person that we're dealing with. And quite frankly, I don't know if y'all know about trauma, but maybe there's something involved with that because he has had a hard life. He hides his body, thinks he gets away with it, but he didn't because some of the other Hebrews that were enslaved saw him. And eventually the Pharaoh also finds out. So Pharaoh in his anger is looking uh, at Moses and is going to chase him. So Moses runs away. Moses stays away for some time. And he even is able to start a family far away from everything that he went through. And he did. And during this time in particular, God calls out to him. And he does it in a way that none of us have ever received the call. He does it from a burning bush. His voice emanating from a bush that is on fire but not consumed. See, God who we learned when Pastor David preached, is faithful, was committed to saving his people. And the word says that he heard their cry and their groaning, and he said, I'm going to deliver them. And he said, I'm going to save them from the enslavement to the powers of Egypt. So God and Moses speak together in one of the most iconic and remembered events in biblical history. We heard Pastor Henry speak about it last week. He says, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. Not because he don't want to have to mop and sweep when after friends come over, but because the floor is holy, he tells him, take your shoes off. Moses does this, speaking with a faithful and holy God, the faithful and holy God of Israel. And he is tasked to go bring God's people out of Egypt. And if you've been able to read this story, you know Moses wasn't too excited about all that. He was a little nervous about his qualifications and his ability. But eventually, we get to Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, where Moses and his brother Aaron, who was sent as a help with Moses, get to speak to Pharaoh. And the word says this. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go. And they may hold a feast, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I shall obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. And moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks, as in the past. Let them go and gather them. You shall by no means reduce, oh, sorry, by the straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past, you shall impose on them, and you shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. This is the moment. This is the part of the story where we start to think about how Pharaoh's heart is hardened, right? You've heard this in church a few times, or maybe you've seen the movie. So if you've seen the movie, this is probably where they're singing a lot. God starts sending plagues, and any one of you who's seen that movie, and if you're me and David, you'll hear in your head, you who I call brother. Right? You just hear all this stuff in your head, and you, see, you think about all of this craziness 
Let me tell you, the whole time I'm writing the sermon, my brain kept going, this is my home. Again and again, like, I can't. That movie's music is so stuck in my head. <laughs> but God starts sending the plays, and eventually we get most pastors, like, favorite thing to preach about if it's not David and Goliath, them crossing the Red Sea, right? But before we rush so far ahead, because that's not my job this week to talk to you about those events. That's going to be the other pastor's jobs. Let's focus in. A good question to ask as we're reading this is, why does God even want his people to be free? He's just being a nice guy. Say, this is a bad, pretty bad situation. They don't deserve this. What is God doing? Well, you look in the verses, and it says pretty clearly in the first verse that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. God's primary motivation is to be glorified. It's his primary motivation. That they may hold a feast to me. He's doing everything he can in the simplest of ways to reveal himself as the God of the universe. To be honored and revered as he should be. To be with his people in a feast. They even say, please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice the Lord our God. Clearly saying that there'd be some issues if fire would not let them go. And in these simple requests, God makes known to Pharaoh that he is not some random lowercase g God the people worship. He is not some weird desert God of the people, but he is the supreme God of the universe. He comes to the king, the pharaoh, the ruler in charge, who believes that his word must be listened to and says, these people must be freed. They have to come make a feast to me. The king must let God's people go so that they can honor him and make an offering to the Lord and bring him glory. See, Pharaoh sees himself as the sovereign of this land. But God is making clear that he is the true sovereign. And for those of you that don't know what that means, to call someone the sovereign is to claim that they are the supreme leader, that they possess ultimate power. Pharaoh would have certainly looked at himself this way as he ruled Egypt and subjugated the people of Israel. But God is making it very clear that this is not the case. They needed to stop working for Pharaoh so that they could go honor their one true sovereign, the living God. Pharaoh's spicy, though. He's a little crazy. So he decides to bug out real quick and say, who's the Lord? that I should obey his voice and let Israel go. I don't know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. The boldness in his statement reveals to us just a few things really quickly. The Pharaoh doesn't know the Lord. The Pharaoh does not honor the Lord. And the Pharaoh does not listen to the Lord. You're a Christian in this room. Those are not good things to be listed in your resume. <laughs> Somebody that don't know God, don't honor God, and don't listen to God. And this is who Pharaoh is. And he's so annoyed. He says, why do you come to me with this? These people, go, go back to your burdens. He's annoyed that Moses and Aaron would come to waste his time. Do they not know who he is? Telling him what their God wants. That, that he comes to the conclusion, you know what? These people have time to cry out. Because they're not working hard enough. Like any other totalitarian ruler, like any other unreasonable person in charge, he says, you know what? You must just not be doing enough. You got too much time to cry out to God. If No, no, no. I got to make this harder. So stop giving them straw. But they still got to make these bricks be piled up by the end of the day the same exact, in the same exact amount of time. Don't give them less work, but give them less help because they got a little much, too much time on their hands. And it's interesting when you look at this, because in his arrogance, he says, I must not have oppressed them enough. Because they shouldn't have this time. They should be working for me, not being worried about doing something for the Lord. Even in the way that, that it's written, is rather interesting. Because they come to him and says, thus says the Lord. 
And at the end, the foreman and the taskmaster go out and they say, thus says Pharaoh. So God has his representatives say, thus say the Lord. And then Pharaoh, to flex real quick, has his representatives say, well, thus says me. And this is the stalemate that God is coming against this king who believes he is the sovereign ruler of these people. And he's like, excuse me, that's definitely me. And the Pharaoh's like, well, I don't necessarily agree. I don't think that's the case. To me, it was a pretty bad situation. God sends Moses, a man who doesn't really think people are going to listen to him, to save them from a ruler who isn't interested in listening at all. And as a matter of fact, is not going to listen, and we already know that. Why? Because in Exodus chapter 4, verses 21 through 23, God says something rather interesting. It says, and the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, See that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. What? See that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I'm going to harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. This is not like a little battle between two cute little friends who's mad at each other and like at equal power. God's like, well, if you don't let them go and you're taking my son, I'm going to take yours permanently. So I don't know if you knew this, and I think it's important that you do know this as we move into the story, but the God that we serve is a good God. It's impossible for God to do what is bad. It is not just that he won't. He literally will not. It is not who he is. He cannot do, he will not do anything outside of his character. Not by our own estimations or by our definitions, but by his own. Because he is the author and creator of all that is good. He's the author and creator of the word of the concept of that truth. He is the first, the only, and the ultimate God. And the first, the only, and the ultimate good. That being said, because he is good, he must also be just. Every time, without fail. And since the garden, actually, humanity has attempted to redefine what is good, and evil on our own terms at the expense of others instead of doing what we were made to do. That is to be God's representatives who rule the world by his definitions of good and evil by his standards. Did you know that God saw it to be good? He delighted in the idea of participating with us and having human participation in the story of this world, not because he was insufficient or he was so sad and needed you to complete him, not because of any of that, but because he was complete and whole in himself. He delighted in participating with you and me, with Adam and Eve, and with the people in scripture to work out his plan because he saw that it was good. And despite our propensity to bend towards that end of redefining things in our own way, for our own benefit, and at the expense and disadvantage of others. God remains a God who stands with the oppressed by, th by those of us. And he stands against those who disregard the dignity of other image bearers to meet their own ends. In this situation right here, God is honoring his commitment to his people. He's committed to delivering them, bringing justice to the injustice perpetrated by the Egyptian rulers. But he's also, quite frankly, because this ain't middle of my hand, I'm going to say it just like I'm going to say it. He is about that action. God is not trying to play. He's not talking to Pharaoh like he's sitting at the grown up table. He's speaking from the big boy table to the little boy table saying, let my people go. Or, and he should be shook. 
He said, listen, go tell Pharaoh, I'm here to see about my people. But look, I'm going to keep it a buck. He ain't going to jack that he even needs to listen to me. And that's going to be because I set it up that way. Then remind him, though, that Israel is my firstborn son. So if you don't let my son go to serve me instead of him, then I'm going to murk his son. It wasn't a cute little thing that he's not actually going to do. God wasn't bluffing. Like, let me see if I scare him real quick. You remember in chapter one, when the old Pharaoh that didn't remember Joseph kills all the firstborn sons of the Israelites? When he did that, he committed a great injustice against God's people and thereby committing a grave injustice against God himself. God knows what he is doing in this situation. And he's not bought by Pharaoh's response. He sends Moses to deal with the present and past injustices, but this takes intricate planning. God hardens Pharaoh's heart and sends Moses anyway because God deemed this to be good and just. He not only will free his people from oppression, but he plans to bring Pharaoh to justice as well. You see this in Exodus 5, 22 to chapter six, verse one. When, when Pharaoh says all of this and makes things harder for the Israelites, Moses is upset and confused. And he turns to the Lord and says, oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. But the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will send them out, and with a strong hand, he will drive them out of this land. Very clearly, we see in the text that Moses thinks that what God has done here is evil. He hardened Pharaoh's heart. He sends Moses into a seemingly useless conversation that only made things worse for the people of Israel. Why would God do this? Why would he allow this pain? Why would he send Moses and harden Pharaoh's heart? Have you had questions like that? Have you had situations in your life that feel that way? But you told me to do this, and I did it. And you said, when I do this, this will happen. But that's not what happened. But you said... And this happened. You're supposed to be good, right? I just said that God is good, but this feels evil. This feels mean. This feels wrong. When God answers Moses with a promise, he says, now you shall see what I will do. Because when God says you shall and that he will, you can count that as a promise. Because he never lies. He promises that Pharaoh was going to let them go with a strong hand, the verse says. In fact, Pharaoh will force them to leave. Please get out. You are evicted. Get out of here. I don't want you here. Stop working on my temples and on my buildings. Bounce. He's going to drive them out, God says in his word. See, Pharaoh has his desires, and Moses has his frustrations, and the Israelites have their anger and their oppression. But God has his plans. And out of all of these things, only one of them stands above the rest. And I'll tell you what the psalmist will tell you, which one it is. Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 says this. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. Just like that. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. 
serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is the God who can make nations your heritage. The ends of the earth, your possession. Fun enough, he did in Christ. It's exactly what he did. In, the psalmist makes this abundantly clear. God is in control. Not of a little bit. Not of some things. Not of the things you think God should be in control of and it makes sense for him to be in control of. But all things. Even I'm gonna say I'm gonna say this. Even the powers of darkness and evil must bow to the ultimate goodness of our God. Pharaoh's heart was dark, wicked, and evil. God hardened what was already an evil heart and set that evil that was already present back on Pharaoh for God's good purposes. Let me make it clear what I'm not saying so you don't walk out of here saying I'm saying something weird. God does not create fresh evil in the heart of people. But he will certainly use the evil that is already present because whether or not a heart may call God Lord, he will still lord over that heart. And if you don't, if you think I'm bugging and I'm wrong, you can argue with the Apostle Paul. He says the best in Romans 9, verses 14 through 24, when he's speaking about the nature of God's gift of salvation. He says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Remember when Moses said God was doing some evil? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, and I have heard people say this. I've said this. Why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? If Pharaoh's heart was hardened by God, isn't it God's fault? But who are you, the apostle Paul says, oh man, to answer back to God? Wow. Will what is molded Say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? In order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles, for his glory, by his purpose, by his estimation and definition. All vessels, whether made for honorable use or dishonorable use, will be used to glorify God. Because even, even those who are vessels made to ultimately be destroyed will bring God glory. And we see that here with Pharaoh. We see this so clearly here in Exodus. I can see why when the Apostle Paul is writing the letter to Romans, he points towards this book when he writes in the verse, verses 17 and 18 citing Moses, Moses and Pharaoh. God starts this out by telling Pharaoh to let his people go to the wilderness. God promises this for his people. The route may have been vastly different than what anyone might have expected. But spoiler alert, if you haven't read the whole book of Exodus, the promise is fulfilled. When rulers do what they desire, and when people find themselves confused by God's ways, and when people are in deep pain and oppression, one thing still remains true. God's sovereign plans will prevail. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. It's going to happen. 
So you got to check this out. When you think back to the Pharaoh in Exodus 1, who kills the firstborn sons of the Hebrews in that time, you see that he does something that God cannot stand. They start the conflict with the death of the firstborn sons. And this conflict ends on the same kind of death. Because finally, later on in this story, in this sequence of events, in this rich history that we get to look back on, God kills the, first sons, the firstborn sons of Egypt. And this is what finally pushes Pharaoh and the people of Egypt far enough that they let the people of Israel go. It starts and ends with this. And what's interesting is when you look at the story of the Bible, it's not so different. You see that in Genesis, Adam is deceived by one who is like Pharaoh, who doesn't value Adam's human dignity and disregards him as an image bearer. He deceives him and the wicked being brings death from that point on to all the sons of Adam, similar to the Pharaoh killing all the Hebrew sons. And the people, much like the people of Israel in this time, have no hope, finding themselves perpetually under oppression, them to the rulers of Egypt and the rest of us to sin and death. Evil runs rampant, rulers oppress those who are weak, and injustice is normal as people redefine continually the standards of good and evil to their liking, disregarding God's standards and definitions. But later on in this wonderful, wonderful story, another son is killed. And when this son is killed, freedom is brought to the people. See, because when Adam is deceived and death comes, we have no hope. But when Jesus is killed and death comes, we find our ultimate hope. Because these conflicts may start and end this way, but God is the sovereign over the conflict. The beginning and the end is known to him, planned by him, and he is actively present in the plans. See, God's sovereignty is not passive. He's not making plans from a war room and saying, go make this happen. He is the one enacting the plan. So when you see the sovereign hand of God in your life, it is indeed his hand literally present with you now. He's not a God that sits back and sends out lackeys. He's a God who is present at every point of history in every place on earth because he is omniscient and omnipresent and the only one capable of such a feat. See, presuming the ability to con control the ultimate outcome for the Egyptian people, Pharaoh's injustice was what kills the firstborn sons of Israel. But assuming his actual ability to control the ultimate outcome for all peoples, God's justice brings death to the firstborn sons of Egypt and freedom to God's people. Because when God restores, he does it while bringing justice. We see that because when his son dies, Sin and death have no more power over us as we cross over into the new life of Christ, much like the Egyptians were able to cross over from Egypt. God restores his people, reconciling them to himself while also satisfying his wrath justly with the death of his son on the cross. God is a sovereign God, intricately planning the restoration of all peoples to himself, while also bringing justice to all wrongs that have occurred through all space and time. Let me tell you who you worship. You worship the best planner and executor in all of the universe. Our sovereign king who goes before us, stands behind us, and holds us up because he is active in this story. See, these things happening in the text, like the things that happen in your life, are not accidents. They are plans. They are not circumstances. They are calculated choices. They aren't moments of conjecture. They are monuments to certainty. 
When we say that God is sovereign, we're not saying he's just watching his plans pan out. When we say God is sovereign, we're saying he's making his plans come to pass. God's sovereignty is not passive, it is active. Just as he has been present here in the story of Exodus, he is present today, willing and working to act in order to fulfill his good purpose, as it says in Philippians. This is the God that we serve. A God who is truly faithful, a God who is truly holy, and a God who is truly sovereign. You walk away with anything today. When you read these stories, when you see the, music, the confusion that Moses faces, and the sadness of the human experience that the Israelites face, know that they are literally not alone, that their God goes before them. And while they did not expect it in these ways, and they're not always very grateful, <laughs> like we can be when things go wrong and we don't get why God does it. Ultimately, when he says that they must go to the wilderness to have a feast, they do. Right. And God, because he is so good, maintains his character of faithfulness, holiness, and sovereignty maintaining his desire to participate with us using representatives like Moses and Aaron, even using a vessel for dishonor like Pharaoh. Pray with me. God, we thank you. We thank you because you are holy. We thank you because you are just. We thank you because you are good. Who are we? Like it says in the song, Amazing Grace, that you would take wretches like us, disgusting, broken, dilapidated vessels, that you would restore us. We thank you for the dignity you have given us, that we are considered image bearers. We thank you. We thank you, God, for what you've done for your people here in Exodus. And we thank you for what you've done for us similarly the sacrifice of your son. God, we ask that you help us to see your sovereignty in moments where we feel like Moses, we have confusion and think that maybe what you have done is evil. Would we step into those moments remembering that you are good, you are just, and you are righteous, so you have a plan. And just because we can't see it doesn't mean that it's not happening. Can we hold on to your promises from your scripture? that you work out everything for the good of those that love you. Lord, when we see you being sovereign, when we're struggling to understand how exactly that's playing out, would you quicken our hearts to remember who you are, to read your word and see what you've done for your people since the beginning and what you continue to do. How you, from one moment in history with Adam and Eve, all the way to Jesus, intricately planned our restoration and for justice to be brought. Not only did you reconcile us to yourself, but you satisfied your wrath. Only you could plan such a feat. And so in our day-to-day -day lives, where we'd see that you have plans and they will prevail, where we find ourselves patient, honoring you, loving you, living like your son, as we live in this world that you've so graciously given to us. We wait on your return, God. Excited for that day. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Io, for that message. Uh, my name is David Lopez. Uh, I have the honor and privilege of letting you know what's happening in the life of our church. Uh, starting off, if this is your first time here, uh, or if you've just never connected to everything that's happening at Joeway Church, uh, what I'd love for you to do is to text the number 94,000. You're going to text JVIP to the number 94,000. Uh, let's us uh, keep you updated on everything that's happening uh, from our block parties, which we'll talk about in a moment, to uh, some of the other events that we have going on. Speaking of block parties, uh, we do block parties every single Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, what we want you to do, though, for our sake, is to register 
for those, uh, register for those. The reason is uh, at our block parties, we serve food. We'd like to feed you. And we want to know exactly how much food uh, we should buy and exactly who's coming. So if you're going to join us, would you, uh, not if you're going to join us, hey, join us, but would you join us and then also register online on the Church Center app? Uh, then last but certainly not least, we've got our giving. Uh, you can text any amount to 84321. Uh, or you can just click the link uh, in a church center app and fill that out. Uh, your giving goes towards making sure that we can keep lights on here, that we can stay in this beautiful space, uh, but then also towards some of the, the other events that we have planned. We, we need your help uh, as a community to make sure that we are growing and able to serve uh, the people here in this church. So we ask that you would, that you would give uh, to us. Um, with that, allow me to, to bless you. Would you uh, bow your heads really quickly as I pronounce God's blessing over you? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. May the Father give you unshakable and unwavering faith in the Son, Jesus Christ, as we find our rest and joy in him. Joyway Church, I love you. You're blessed.